Great. Um, thank you for joining us today for our first colloquium of 2023. It is my pleasure to introduce Dion Cross Francis, who is the Joseph Niekirk Term Professor in the Culture Curriculum and Teacher Education Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on understanding the contextual, cultural, and teacher-specific factors that motivate teacher planning and instruction with the goal of determining the optimal design features of PD that allow teachers to thrive. Results of this work have informed the design and implementation of PD initiatives nationally in both Indiana and Georgia, as well as internationally in Jamaica, Turkey, Kosovo, South Sudan, Ghana, um, which is upcoming. Dr. Cross Francis has been awarded the National K-12 Promotion of Education Award for promoting STEM education from the 2014 Women of Colors STEM Conference, the Oak Ridge Associated University's Junior Faculty Enhancement Award, the APA Division 15 Early Career Award, and the University of Georgia's Young Alumni Award. The IU School of Education also awarded her the Student's Choice for Excellence in Teaching Award, the Graduate Student Mentoring Award, and the Trustees Teaching Award for her work with pre-service teachers and graduate students. She's co-editor and co-author of two books, and her work has been featured in top journals of the field, including the Journal of Mathematics Behavior, Journal of Mathematics Teacher Education, Teacher's College Record, Educational Studies in Mathematics, and Teaching in Teacher Education. And we are thrilled to have her here with us today. Thank you, Sandra. Welcome, everyone. It's nice to see the faces that I can see. Um, I always start with an appeal that if it's if you're pos if it's possible and you're able to, um, if you could turn on your camera for a little bit, even at the start, just so I can get a sense of who I'm looking at. Um, that's it's always kind of nice to make that connection initially, but completely understand if you're not able to do that at this time. Hi, Karen. <laughs> um, and I'm totally fine if you need to just have your camera on and look in a different direction. I also understand how that works, where sometimes your camera isn't set up to do that. Um, all right, I'll go ahead and just share um, some of the slides that I have um, to kind of guide what I'll share with you today. Um, and then I'll start with a little bit of an overview of how I've kind of organized the slides um, and my talk today. So I'll start out by saying a little bit about me. Um, and one of the reasons that I do that is that I, I find it really useful when researchers position themselves. So the, the, the audience or the reader of the work kind of understands your own positionality and how you come to do, be doing this work. Um, I'll start with a little bit of my background and some of the early work that I did and how that kind of led up into um, a coaching model that I've now um, kind of designed and have been testing out. Um, and I've tried to do that in two contexts. Um, I situate this as a kind of like a mathematics instructional coaching model, but really I've done a lot more work on it in science ed than I have in, in math ed. So, um, at some point, we may be able to kind of, or I may be able to kind of think about it more as how to promote, um, to support teachers in STEM um, rather than just in either discipline. So hopefully that kind of fits within the scope of the center and kind of the work that um, everyone is doing here. All right, so I'm, the way that I think about teachers in general um, in the context of professional development is that they are learners. Um, in some ways, there are common threads for me in terms of the way we think about learners in the K-12 classroom um, and then teachers as learners in professional development. And there's a lot of effort and energy that goes into thinking about how to support learners in the K-12 context um, and what is it that they need? How is it that we need to create that space for them to learn, um, for them to feel nurtured and whole and to support them holistically? Um, and I'm not so sure that we always kind of think about teachers in the context of professional development as learners in this way. And so that is kind of the basis for um, a lot of the work that I'm doing now. Um, and I kind of, I'm gonna take you through the trajectory of how I got there. So let me start first by situating myself. Who am I and how do I come to this work? So I am Jamaican, sometimes that is, you can detect that in my speech and sometimes not. Um, but I do say that because the experiences of someone who grew up on an island that's predominantly black is very different from someone who grew up in the United States where they are considered a minority. Um, and in the way that I, in the classrooms that I'm in and the teachers that I work with, um, that orientation for me is important because sometimes I don't, um, 
I, I have my own biases that I bring to the context, and I also have to bracket those biases in different contexts that I'm in. Um, I'm black sometimes I mean I think you can see that sometimes i'm off camera so it's always I always kind of point that out. Um, and in the context of the US, I would consider myself a first generation college student in my own country that's not even a term that we use it's just not really relevant to how we talk about or you know think about individuals. Um, I went to high school um, in Jamaica I came to the US as an adult um, and so my identity is definitely shaped by my own culture in Jamaica, and I do consider myself an immigrant, even though I'm naturalized. I taught high school in both Jamaica and in the US um, before I went to graduate school. I'm currently a researcher and a professional development um, professional, and I think more broadly as a professional development individual, even though I work with pre service teachers as an aspect of my job, but my research generally focuses mainly on supporting teachers who are in practice. Um, typically referred to as in-service teachers. Um, I've supported teachers both in the US and across several countries. Um, I do like to, I think context matters and context is important. And sometimes it's really useful for me to be in a different context to recognize the ways in which context in North America really shows up a lot, um, but we can be blinded to that if we're only doing work within the North American context. So I find it useful to do work out of the country as a way of really helping me to to attend to some of the contextual issues within the North American classroom context. Um, I'm also a mother um, and for me when I became I grew this human um, and she entered this world, my perspective on thinking about learning um, kind of changed, um, I think a lot of the thinking about that before was that there are these external beings that you know i'm really interested in their growth and development, but it was some something that was external to my own daily existence. Um, since becoming a mother i've been a lot more connected to my work and in supporting teachers, because when I go into classrooms and I see students it's hard for me not to see my child. Um, and also to see myself in the teacher and want what's best for them holistically. Um, I would want someone to have come into my classroom and see me as a person and not only a teacher to get data from, as I want to go into the classrooms and look at those students in the way that I would see my child and this, you know, really brilliant individual who I have the opportunity to shape the kind of context that she can learn in. So that's kind of what I, I how I position myself or how I'm positioned kind of in this work. Um, and a part of it was I, as a teacher, um, when I was teaching, and I, I was not a very good teacher when I was teaching, um, I can see that now far more clearly. At the time, I thought I was like doing a really good job, um, was I wanted students to come to math class and look less like the student on the left and kind of more like the students on the right, just kind of in awe of mathematics, just really fully engaged in what's going on like feel like they belong in that, like they can ask questions, like they're in this experience of wonder and amazement and growth with the teacher. Um, and I realized that through my own experience that um, if I could work with teachers and help them to shape classrooms in this way where students actually look and feel like that, um, then it would have a far reach than kind of working with students. And so I kind of shifted my attention to teachers over the time um, when I was doing my graduate work and so kind of mainly focus on teachers now, uh, but use data from students to inform that work. I have some orienting assumptions um, in terms of how I kind of enter classrooms and I see classrooms. Um, I see them as systems and when I think about a system, I think about it as a set of parts um, united by some form of interaction for the attainment of a specific purpose in the classroom context is about learning. Um, I think for many of us, we think about it as learning for the student, but it's also a really, really vibrant place for learning for the teacher. And I think it's a continuous learning for both. Um, for those of us who have been teachers or study teachers, you know that you as a teacher, you're learning every time you engage with your students. Um, so moment to moment, day to day, and definitely year to year as you get different brains in your classroom that you're interacting with. Um, but the system itself is more than the sum of its parts. So it's not just the curriculum plus the teacher plus the student, but there's kind of like this ethos that has to go on in the classroom in order for teachers and students to feel connected 
for them to vibe, for them to jive together, for that real learning and engagement to go on in ways that are productive for both. I also think about um, the, the learning ecology kind of like this um, interconnected set of like organisms and parts that need to work together um, to create this product that we measure and consider to be learning. Um, and so it's uh, learning opportunities become possible and are shaped by the learning ecology that learn inhabits. So the physical, social, cultural context in which learning takes place. And I sometimes like to give an example of this where I think as a as a black person um, in North America, and when you read the literature and a lot of what surrounds students of color, it's that they go into classrooms and they often have experiences of feeling incompetent, um, not capable, um, that they don't belong there, that they're not thinkers. Um, and I, when I think about my own experience, I never entered a classroom ever feeling that way. Um, I can't say it's because I grew up in a space where everyone I looked at and saw were black, including the teachers, but I don't connect with that experience of going into a classroom and a teacher not thinking that I was capable of more than I was even producing, just as a basic assumption about the students in the classroom. I can't say that's all students, but um, when I think about just juxtaposing that, that I can show up in a classroom here and know that for a lot of students who look like me, they weren't, they're not having a similar experience. And so when I go into a try to get a sense of like, how are these, how is the history, how is the socio-historical context that students are positioned in um, shaping how they're actually experienced and how they show up in that space. And that's more than just what the teacher is doing and how the teacher is engaging them, but what messages external to the classroom do they bring with them into this space and how is that helping to shape how they can engage and how teachers can engage with them. Um, and I think that considering those things are really important when you're working um, with teachers and students in K-12 settings. And I just have a little diagram here in terms of just kind of visually representing some of the things that we think about in terms of um, conceptualizing this ecology um, where the, the teacher and students are at the center. So I situate a lot of my work, as I said, in thinking about um, how the classroom and how the teacher is positioned within this larger context. And I draw from Bronfen Brenner's ecological systems theory. Um, it was a theory that was developed around the child um, and um, nested within these systems that were positioned relative to the distance from the child. Um, I take the child out and I put the teacher in and try to think about, okay, when the teacher is at the center, what are um, the different systems that are operating on the teacher that might be impeding or supporting the teacher's development? And I find it quite useful in terms of thinking about, well, how do I play an important, what is my role then as a professional developer working with teachers and hoping that they're gonna flourish and develop in a similar way that when we work with students, we want them to flourish and develop. So in terms of thinking when you, draw on the Braun friend Brenner's, let me go back to that for a second. Um, if we think about the macro system, the macro system is kind of, um, what are the ideas and the ideology that's going on in the external environment that's kind of um, influencing what's going on in the teacher's more nested, closer micro system. Um, and a part of that is thinking about, well, what's going on like nationally in terms of how students are achieving mathematically and how that kind of informs policies that tend to shape. So what federal policies then to shape shape state policies that then become district policies that then enter the classrooms. Um, so as I go through this talk, I'll try to make sure that I'm highlighting kind of data we have pre pandemic and kind of data that we have during pandemic and post pandemic because some of that, as you know might be kind of, you know, um, enhanced a little bit be just because of hopefully the, the, the pandemic period is an anomaly. It's likely that we'll have another one, but let's kind of pretend that it, it won't happen again. Um, but also knowing that it has changed the ec educational landscape, it definitely changed it for two to three years, and we will continue to feel the ripple effects of that for a couple of years. 
um, but where are we now and that we can't just decide, oh, it's going to change. We really have to grapple with the conditions that teachers are engaged in right now. So I looked at data from 2015, 2017, and just kind of got a sense from the, the nation's report card, which is the NAP data with respect to fourth grade and eighth grade students. Um, and in general, they're not doing, we're not doing very well, um, but I know that it tipped upwards for the 2019 data. When the 2022 data came out, which was you know recently within the last few months, um, some of the main highlights of that data was that for fourth grade and eighth grade, they went down by five points and eight points respectively, but then that was kind of the lowest drop since early 2000. And so in that case, it was stark. Of course, we'll say, well, this is probably a reflection of, you know, a lot of the learning loss from COVID. But if we think about it in terms of the teacher, imagine the kind of um, stressors that are going to be placed on our teachers and have been placed on our teachers now because the responsibility tends to fall on their shoulders. So when we think about that, we think about, well, you know, like, you know, what's going on within our system, right? It's not quite producing what it is that we want it to produce, like this great learning of mathematics that we hope it is. Um, and no one else tends to take the blame. It tends to always form a fallen teachers. And if the news in your part of the country is similar to the news in my part of the country, it generally centers around a conversation with teachers and what teachers aren't doing. Um, and so the blame, we might talk about let's change our curriculum or we might modify tests, but then it does come down to what are teachers doing in the classroom. So here we have just kind of like a visual. So we know that there are a lot of factors that play into how students learn. Significant portion of them are outside of the classroom. It's society shaped, it's community shaped, it's home shaped. Um, but then we find that all of that weight kind of comes back to how is the teacher going to fix all that to make sure that students are doing well. Um, and in a completely other conversation, I can tell you my thoughts on that in terms of teachers are now becoming increasingly more responsible for development of children beyond just the academic and intellectual development. And in many ways, they're not trained for that. Schools are now becoming places where they're to raise the whole child. Um, it's as if they're parent free and community free. Um, but that's for another conversation. We'll just kind of stick with this one. But just as a way of thinking about teachers are becoming increasingly responsible for the psychological, social, emotional, and academic well being of children. Um, and so when I say that, we can't just think about, oh, it's post pandemic. And so, you know, we can kind of write off because of a lot what that unfolded during the pandemic, the face and the responsibilities of teachers are changing and it's not going away. So thinking about, you know, um, as I said, I put the teacher at the center. One of the things that I was really interested in when I went to grad school was kind of like what makes teachers tick tick. Like when they show up in the classroom and they're doing these amazing things with students, what keeps them going, what brings them there, what shapes the decision making, how do we kind of figure that out? Just figuring that out is really useful for how we can help and support them. I think I'll stop here um, just to say that it's fine if you want to ask questions as I'm going through and if you want to put questions in the chat, um, Chandra has agreed to kind of moderate that and let me know if a question pops up, I'll stop and, and I can respond. Just wanted to say that. So um, when I went to grad school, I was working uh, in the mathematics context, but I was really focused a lot on trying to understand the constructs that would fall within the area of educational psychology. Um, and one of the constructs that I was particularly interested in was, um, was beliefs and how beliefs shaped and supported and informed teachers' decision-making, specifically um, math-related beliefs um, for the math classroom, but then also self-beliefs like efficacy beliefs um, and so on. Um, I think what I found from my research in that area um, kind of converges and also deviates a little bit with some of the research um, that's out there. One, we know beliefs inform practices. Um, uh, some of the literature talks about that there is alignment. So what teachers believe you'll see kind of actualized in their practice. Um, there's also a 
quite a breadth of literature that will say that is not always the case, that teachers will state beliefs, but you don't actually see those pop up in practice. Um, there's a, a piece by, um, by Leotham that talks about teachers as being sensible beings and that they're consistent beings, um, that we as human beings and also as teachers are consistent. And so when we see a potential misalignment between what teachers say they believe and what we're seeing in the classroom, that it's because we have, we're looking through a very narrow lens, like our interpretation of what they're saying is focusing us on looking for a particular practice. And that may not be what is most influential in that moment. Um, I thought that that seemed to align best with um, the way that I was conceptualizing teachers, that they were these sensible beings um, and that I needed to cast a wider net in terms of thinking about what are some of the other constructs that inform teacher actions and teacher decision making. And so I started to look at what does the literature say about what other constructs kind of come to play um, in the whole decision making um, and how teachers actually shape and implement instruction. I'll come back to what I have here at the end um, in a minute. So I started to explore some other constructs, emotions um, and identity um, to, to get a sense of, well, what did the literature say in terms of what, um, how these constructs informed what teachers were doing in their classroom? Some of the things that came out of um, that work, one, um, for anyone who's been in a classroom, whether you're a student or a learner, you know that it's a really emotional space. The process of actually learning and grappling to make an idea is an emotional process. The process of trying to facilitate this process of learning and you know grappling with ideas and making ideas is an emotional process for so it's both for teacher and for students and whenever you meet and engage with um, individuals um, it's likely human beings essentially it's going to you're going to have an emotional connection um, in this work i drew on um, a more of a cognitive oriented perspective in terms of emotions being elicited um, as teachers evaluated progress towards the goals that they're setting. Um, we know that teachers don't just generally have one goal in a classroom, they have a, a range of goals that they have for each lesson. They may be content goals, as in I want students to be able to grasp or, um, or be able to understand particular concepts. Um, they also have specific instructional goals, like I want to use this particular teaching techniques or this set of teaching techniques to um, support students in learning these ideas. They may also have student related goals related to behavior related to student thinking. So there are all of these goals, sometimes not explicit, that they are trying to achieve in any particular lesson and that they're keeping track of whether or not there's any explicit tracking in their mind or whether it's more subconscious. But as they see the events that are unfolding in the classroom and they're making evaluations about whether or not what is unfolding is helping me to achieve my goal, it triggers different kinds of emotions. What was particularly salient in the literature for several years were how discrete emotions, meaning like these very basic emotions, anger, enjoyment, um, anxiety, frustration, like, how do teachers feel about teaching um, in the math area? How do these discrete emotions show up in teachers teaching and what did they predominantly experience? But what was missing was this accounting of this multiplicity of emotions that can be experienced by teachers during the act of teaching. And so once I started to track teachers emotional um, experiences during the act of teaching, I came up on this construct that was there in the literature, but not so much in teacher and teacher education around blended emotions. And that is the idea that teachers can actually experience multiple emotions of the same or different valence during the act of teaching. So they can feel anxiety and excitement at the same time. One of the things that um, teachers have to be doing while they're teaching is emotionally regulated. So if they're feeling really anxious about a lesson, and I'm just going to throw out fractions because in all of my work with teachers, if there is one topic that they tend to elicit a lot of anxiety is the teaching of fractions. Um, going into a fractions lesson, let's say a division of fractions lesson, lots of anxiety. 
they have to learn how to regulate that in order to be even minimally effective in executing the goals that they have around teaching that particular lesson. Um, but maybe simultaneously, they're a little excited because they've been working with the coach and they have a really new way of um, rolling out or launching a concept and they feel like this is gonna really connect with their students. So then they're in this situation where they're regulating these two emotions, maybe of equal intensity, but of opposite valence, while also trying to keep track of the other goals that they're having. So when I say that emotions are um, quite palpable and they are um, very present in teachers' decision-making, um, they are, and it's a construct that is overlooked, but it's really useful for us to kind of attend to in terms of thinking about how we can support teachers. Um, there's a question from Beth. She's sure. wondering, have, have you found in your research that elementary school teachers self-select as non-math people, that their insecurity related to lack of math acumen bleeds into their practice and affects young students' confidence? Yes, yes, and yes, with exclamation points. Um, and uh, elementary teachers, and I'll get to a slide, well, it's right here with identity. You frame that as I would. They are elementary teachers often considering themselves generalists who just have to teach math. They don't gen typically, very rarely do I meet um, teachers, elementary teachers who feel comfortable saying that they're math teachers. They will say, no, I'm a first grade teacher or I'm a second grade teacher and I teach math um, or I am a early childhood teacher or, you know, they'll identify with the grade or they identify more with a discipline like reading and language arts, um, but rarely do they even consider themselves math teachers. Um, and so there's a there's oftentimes medium to low efficacy around teaching math and their knowledge of math. Um, and then that kind of yeah spills over into how how much they'll take risks, how much they'll try to engage in new practices, um, and then oftentimes, of course, they communicate that in sometimes very unconscious ways to, to students as well. So that anxiety. Um, so I think I captured the identity part with that question. So thank you, Beth. Um, and then of course the efficacy part as well. Um, one of the things also that I found when I've explored efficacy with the teachers um, in my research is that how they conceptualize efficacy tends to change over time, depending on how you engage with them. So um, let me give you an example of a teacher I was working with who started out um, male teacher, um, really high efficacy with respect to his knowledge of math really high efficacy with respect to his teaching of math, meaning that he believed that the ways that he was engaging students was very um, useful and that it would lead to students learning math deeply. Over the course of the year that we worked together, um, his efficacy um, kind of went up and down. By the end of the year that we worked together, his efficacy in both his knowledge of math and his um, his confidence in his teaching of math were lower than the way that he started. Um, now, when we did the measures of his teaching quality, it had improved notably over that year, um, but his confidence in what he was doing was lower, um, which was really interesting for us because our goal with working with teachers is not to minimize their efficacy, but really to increase their practice so that it matches the efficacy that they have. Um, and so we realize that there is often this issue of efficacy calibration that happens. So it may start out and it goes in both ways too, where sometimes teachers have lower efficacy that does not match the quality of their practice. So they're teaching in a much better way and their knowledge of math is much higher than what they believe. And over the course of um, professional development and coaching, that that helps them to have a better calibration in terms of like, is my level of confidence actually aligning with the quality of my teaching? Um, and so we'll see that it fluctuates throughout and across the, the, the time that they're in professional development. So some of that early work kind of 
led me to some key um, takeaways, some of which I've mentioned before. Um, so this idea of teachers being consistent beings and that it's important to look more broadly at teachers holistically to really kind of tap into what makes them tick. Um, what is it that is informing their decision making, not only in general, but in the act of teaching through a particular lesson. Um, that you have to be very conscientious about the instruments that you're using. Um, quite a bit of the, um, the instruments that were used in the research around um, efficacy and around emotions related to mathematics education is what we would consider to be trait based instruments, which means it gives you a more generalized picture of that construct related to the teacher. So in with the survey instruments and like the teaching, the teacher emotion scale, it asks more general questions about, you know, kind of when you teach math in general, do you often get mad? So it's not asking about a specific lesson or a specific construct. It's kind of asking about your experience teaching math more broadly, which is useful. Um, but when you're working with teachers more closely, I found that to be less useful because the confidence that a teacher will have around teaching concepts of number and addition and subtraction will be different oftentimes if I ask them to teach geometry or teach fractions. Um, the emotions that they have with um, related to teaching math generally, if they teach third or fourth grade, might be really high excitement and really low anxiety. But when again, we start to work with geometry concepts like quadrilaterals, you might find that that efficacy is much lower and the level of anxiety is much higher and they're not really that happy to be teaching it. So working with teachers in um, the professional development context, these instruments were not very useful in informing me of what I was getting when I would show up to talk with a teacher about a particular lesson um, or working with them around a particular set of ideas. Um, I mentioned some of these points. I'll just go through this slide um, quickly. Um, but one thing that I wanted to, to point out was the role of context and just how important it is. And when I say context, I think even like local context. So there's a difference between working in a school with teachers who are very strongly supported by their principals, whose principals engage teachers as competent professionals, um, as opposed to going to a school where there is clearly a disconnect between the principals and the teachers and they don't feel like they're supported heavily or being treated as professionals within that space. So local context, very important in terms of how you can help to support that teacher. Um, and I work from a teacher based perspective and not necessarily from a school based perspective, but that school based understanding is really important for working with the teacher um, as an individual. And I see, yeah, um, did I raise my own hand? I'm so sorry. How did I do that? That is so funny. I didn't touch anything, I promise. Um, but I personally don't have a question, so I'm going to ignore my hand. Um, okay, next slide. That was too funny. So having done all that work and kind of figure out, well, what are some of the constructs that I think are really useful in informing um, <clears throat> how to work with teachers, I started to think about how do I cast this wide lens um, and then think about teachers as learners and some of the, the ways that we think about student learners. So we know that having an emotionally safe space is really important for learning. We know that really understanding the child as a learner is really important for supporting learning. We know that understanding the context, the home context, the life of the child is really important for their learning. So why is that not as important when I'm working with teachers? And I think I came to the conclusion after several years that this was equally important. Um, I was also working with a professional. So this had to be more of a collaborative space where we were learning together and growing together because teachers are professionals, even though they're learners and they're coming to this space with depth of knowledge that even I don't have. I don't know their classrooms and I don't know their kids. And so there has to be um, these mutually shared goals that we're working towards achieving. Um, and so one of the big questions that I was trying to kind of explore 
was what are the design features of mathematics professional development that will support this ambitious teaching um, that we're all looking for in the mathematics classroom. Um, and I have a definition here of ambitious instruction, but it really is what we consider to be culturally relevant teaching that really supports students to be problem solvers and really deep thinkers of mathematics um, and creators of ideas and not just users or consumers of ideas that have already been generated. Um, one of my colleagues, Keith Sawyer, and you know, in one of the papers that he wrote around 2008, where he talked about that research um, would suggest that the more effective learning will occur if each learner receives a customized learning experience. Um, and so that connected really, really strongly with what was coming out of my research with respect to um, if I wanted to work with teachers, I really had to think about them as these individuals um, and what they were bringing to the professional development context and how to kind of use that to understand and support them. So in 2001, um, Garrett and the colleagues from, I think at the time it was it's AIR, um, this research came out of, came up with this consensus model of professional development. And it had these five, I think, um, you and Desmoni have now made it into six, but it really is kind of the same, the similar features. Um, there needs to be a focus on content. There needs to be opportunities for active learning, um, the support of experts and professional developers in the context of the PD program and in, construct, in conjunction with their teaching is really important. So you can't just be this disconnected set of ideas that they were having um, that wasn't connected to what they were doing in their classrooms that was not gonna be effective. Um, and that there needed to be coherence across what they were learning in the professional development and what they were expected to do with respect to curriculum, tools, district policy standards, all of that, and that it needed to be ongoing, so long term. So if you take a look at this, this seems really sensible, right? Yeah, can I see a thumbs up or a nod if it sounds like it would be a good plan for PD? Yeah, I thought so too. I thought it was great. Um, and a lot of the work coming from that 2001 um, seminal piece described professional development that had a composite of these elements. Um, most of them tried to actually integrate that into, uh, into the way that they were working with teachers. And one professional development model that does this really well is instructional coaching of teachers. But even with this consensus model that seems really sensible conceptually, and had shown promise over years of research, it tended to, um, to show also that whilst it was effective for teachers, it wasn't as effective for student learning. And there's a meta-analysis that was done by Kraft and his colleagues that kind of showed that coaching across reading and math was effective broadly, in with respect to improving teacher quality, but they didn't see simultaneous the positive changes that were also significant with respect to student learning. Another thing that they did not explore was that although teachers instructional quality seemed to be improving as they track the research with instructional coaching. If you track the research with teacher stress, teacher stress and well being was on the decline. So I checked some of the data pre COVID. So at the, the Gallup research report, um, which was pre COVID, kind of showed like 46% of teachers reported feeling highly stressed. One of the things that they talked about in that report, too, was the stress was not, it wasn't that teachers were stressed, everybody within across professions were exhibiting a similar level of stress. So it wasn't alarming. Whilst we don't want anybody to be overly stressed, um, it wasn't like, it was just teachers that was feeling this kind of pressure in their work environment. So let's fast forward that now to 2022. Um, and the RAND report communicated that teacher stress was twice the rate of the general public. So across other professions, 
the data that they got from teachers was that their stress was twice as high as those as other as folks in other professions. So we can see that there is a significant change in the last, what's that, eight years or so. Again, we know that some of it is pandemic related, but we also know that with the pandemic, classrooms have changed and expectations of teachers have changed. And so there's no guarantee that this is going to decline um, as we move further and further away from um, the onset of the pandemic. So I went back again to thinking about um, this ecological model and where the teacher is positioned and starting to think about, well, you know, what are some of the things that we need to attend to or seem to be overlooked in existing models of coaching? So we know that, um, well, maybe we all don't know, but I'm going to share um, that most models of coaching that are currently out there focus on two main things with respect to the teacher. They focus on improving teachers' mathematical content knowledge. I think it would be the same in reading. And it also focuses on supporting teachers in improving their practices, meaning what are you doing as you're engaging with students to improve their learning? If you look at the research, oftentimes they do have a measure of maybe beliefs or they do kind of track teacher's identity. But this is more of an outcome variable. They're seeing how the coaching that their work that they're doing with the teachers are engaging with teachers in how might that be changing their identity or it might be changing their beliefs, but not necessarily that they are factoring in teachers beliefs and their identity as an important aspect to pay attention to in the way that they interact and engage with teachers. And that's kind of where I want to position my work in terms of thinking about the teacher as that whole being that we need to attend to. I think it would be really challenging to make an argument to say, oh, I'm going to work with my students, but I'm not really concerned about who they are as people, how they feel when they come to class, um, how confident they are in mathematics. That's not particularly relevant. I'm just going to design, you know, what I want them to learn and kind of work with them in that space. And I think that this one size fits all approach to professional development really overlooks what we know about high quality learning and engagement um, when it comes to teachers. Um, another thing to consider is also when we think about teacher stress, um, quite a bit of the research does point to the classroom and school related context in terms of issues that produce the stress. So student misbehavior is a significant one. Work overload is another one. Low pay, low salary is a third one that kind of um, triggers or heightens the stress. But we also want to think about that teachers are now within this macro context that is producing additional stress. I would say in a lot of ways, STEM teachers are not at the forefront of this. We're seeing language arts and social studies teachers being caught up in this particular this political game around critical race theory, et cetera. But whether or not we're having guidelines or restrictions based on our curriculum, we have students of color in our classrooms. And if we are going to attend to who they are, the communities that they come from, and really um, tap into their funds of knowledge, then we really cannot ignore the larger context in which they're coming from. And teachers do have to take on that political baggage when they actually um, are in the school context. So taking all this into the consideration, I designed um, a coaching model that I refer to as the holistic individualized coaching model that I've kind of worked with teachers, mainly in the science education context, but also in the mathematics education context in, um, in the US and in Ghana most recently. Um, and I'll walk you a little bit through the steps of this coaching model and kind of highlight the ways in which it's different from um, the existing models of support for teachers um, currently, currently being used. So I start out with a comprehensive um, profile development of the teacher, um, and I try to get uh, information on all of the constructs that I mentioned before. So what are their math specific beliefs? What's their level of confidence related to math and math teaching? How do they position themselves as um, teachers within the classroom? 
I should say I primarily work with elementary teachers. Um, and I also try to get a sense of their perception of the context in which they're working with, both locally, as in within their school, and then also more generally within the society um, in general. Um, I have a comprehensive interview with the teacher before I even start, and I do a visit to their classroom um, before we even start working together in this coaching interaction. The information that I gather from the interview and from the surveys that I have them complete, I create a general profile of the teacher. So I know um, their emotions generally when they're thinking about mathematics, I have a sense of how they position themselves in the classroom, their level of efficacy, kind of all of that. I create um, a model of the teacher. So I know who I'm working with and I know the areas that I need to work on with the teacher. Let me give you an example of what that might look like. So let's say I have teacher A um, and teacher A has really high efficacy, but when I went to visit and record the classroom and um, got a measure of their mathematical quality of teaching, I recognized that the, uh, the dimensions of teaching quality did not match their efficacy. Um, and I also observed that they were very calm when they were teaching class. They had fairly neutral emotions related to teaching mathematics, no heightened excitement, no heightened anxiety, just kind of general neutral emotions. So that's teacher A. And let's say I have teacher B who has really low efficacy, um, but really teaches well um, and has really high anxiety around teaching in general. Um, here are two teachers I'm working with. There's no way that my approach to working with those two teachers are go can be the same. Um, because they're individuals and I'm working with two different professionals um, and who have a different, different sets of goals most of the time around their teaching. But ultimately what we want to do is to get them to a place where they feel like they're thriving in their teaching and that they're seeing some of that evidence in terms of their students learning. Um, we set out a, uh, a set of um, guidelines about how often we're gonna meet. Usually it's it's once a, once a month or once every six weeks. I typically work with teachers over five cycles of coaching um, and then two um, end engagements where I'm really kind of doing a debrief and collecting of data. Um, let's say around the first coaching, for each coaching experience, we have a pre-discussion and in that pre-discussion, um, which I think is very typical of content coaching and other instructional coaching models where they have the pre-coaching session, the coaching session, which is in the classroom, and then also the post-lesson breakdown. What is different with my pre-discussion is that I'm talking more, um, getting a sense of a history of the teacher with this particular concept. So let's say we're teaching um, a lesson on triangles. I would want to get a sense of the teacher of um, talk to me a little bit about your history teaching triangles. Have you taught this lesson before? How did it go? What is your thinking around that? Um, what are some of the things that you might change? What do you want to see out of this lesson? So I get this history. How do you feel about teaching? How did it go? So I also get a profile, a mini profile of the teacher related that particular concept. One of the things that I've learned in my work is a teacher can be highly competent in teaching two-digit addition and subtraction, and less competent in teaching a lesson on triangles. And so it's really important that I have that more localized knowledge around the construct in order to really be able to shape how I'm gonna work with the teacher. So if the teacher has a lot of anxiety around teaching geometry, then one of the things that I need to find out is what is the source of that anxiety and work with the teacher to help to regulate that emotion so that they're able to really focus and attend to the learning context in a way that's really meaningful. If I find that they're overly confident around their teaching, while there's evidence that would suggest that they need a little bit of support, then I would try to engage them in a way to help to calibrate that efficacy with actually the lesson that they have to teach. Um, and that's not, again, trying to decrease their efficacy but helping them to plan and work on a lesson so that the quality of the lesson actually matches the efficacy that they have. We go to the class. I'm always present in the classroom when they teach the lesson. Um, I do not co-teach. That's also something that's fairly different from existing models. And I do not model lessons for the teacher. Um, I really am there more like 
how you would see like a football coach in a field. I'm on the sidelines. I'm watching what plays are going on. I'm observing things that the teacher is observing um, themselves and then also observing things that they might not see. And the teacher might pull me in at some points to get some advice or I might pull the teacher aside and kind of give them um, some suggestions about what to do. Sometimes I help the teacher to make corrections um, if there are errors in the classroom or so on. But one of the things that I'm particularly conscious of is this is not my classroom. Um, and whatever successes that are experienced in the classroom, I want the teacher to be able to attribute that to their own teaching and not something that I did. Um, not to say that co-teaching or, um, or modeling teaching is a bad thing. I just don't think it works within the context of this particular model. All of the coaching sessions are recorded. We, the teacher watches the video. I also watch the video. The teacher is given very basic guidelines identify two to three instances where um, that you find interesting that you want to talk about for a re for any reason. They can bring it for any reason, um, and I also have clips that i've selected to guide the conversation, the clips that I select are typically centered around student thinking. Um, and helps to focus their attention on how is it what that what they're doing in the classroom is supporting student learning. And then we meet and then we talk. One of the additional ways that I prepare for the post coaching conversation, in addition to preparing the clips, is that I revisit the profiles. So I revisit the general profile to get a sense of remind me who is this individual that I'm working with? What are some of the socially emotional, psychological goals or things that I need to attend to in this conversation? Um, and then also I look at the more local, um, localized profile see you know how is it that what happened in the classroom is um is aligned with the profile and what are some things that can i can work on changing um, and then meet with the teacher and navigate that conversation in a way that is wholesome for the teacher that attends to what i know of the teacher um, and then you know also uh, making sure that the goals that we set together um, are met and then if they're not, then we, you know, kind of revisit that in the next coaching cycle. I'm going to stop there to see if there are any questions or thoughts about that. I just want to take a sip of water. All right, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Um, so what are some of the things I that I had a question, but I, I didn't have a chance to type it. How many teachers in one period can you monitor like that? Um, I usually work with a team of graduate students. So on the larger end, nine over the course of a year. Um, and I would say I, I could do on my own a maximum of probably five. Um, and where the graduate students are particularly useful is they will do an initial so i'm in the classroom and I have that first hand knowledge of the video. But it's they provide additional perspectives when they watch the video and then they prepare a coaching document, and then we can talk a little bit about the profile together, so they provide an additional kind of um, feedback around that, but I do. Um, and I will I do all of the post coaching conversations. Um, so some of the challenges that I've had is like timing, you know, trying to schedule all of the teachers. I tend to be a lot more flexible um, than the teachers, but they're really, really busy. Um, and sometimes it takes a while to kind of get that conversation scheduled and then, you know, begin the next cycle. It is not a question. Yeah, so. Zarina had a question of why do you not model or co-teach? Um, so one of the things that we know about um, uh, how to develop self-efficacy, um, Bandura has a set of like four ways to, to kind of build self-efficacy. There is uh, mastery, there's vicarious experience or emotional, um, emotional states. And one of the things about vicarious experience is, for example, if I consider myself to be a peer of someone doing something and they've done it well, 
then I have more confidence that I can also do it well. So the teachers don't see me as being on the same level of them as a teacher. Um, and so if I'm engaging in the classroom and it turns out to be effective, um, for example, I'm engaging with a student and they grasp an idea or the way I launch the lesson goes particularly well, they don't, that's not a vicarious experience for them because they see me as an expert. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is to work to build their efficacy. And so I focus more on trying to architect mastery experiences, experiences that they are engaged in that, um, that turn out well. Um, and so it can build their confidence in that way. Is that helpful? I'm gonna... I think I think probably so. Yes. Okay. Yes. She's she's dealing with small children, so. Okay. Completely understand that. So she's probably nodding, but can't get to the mute button. Okay. And if at any point you get close to the button and you have another question, or you can type it. Sounds good. Um, all right. So I'll go to the next slide. So what are some of the things that um, that I've learned from this? Um, I can't scream out context matters. Um, and I'll give you a, just a, a little tidbit of that. I was in Ghana last year. I was there for a whole year and um, I worked on um, with a, a set of teachers across private and public schools. And um, in pu public schools in Ghana, the classrooms are really, really large. Uh, no, I, let me say that the number of students in a classroom a lot of students. Um, and let me tell you, when I go into a first grade classroom in the US, typically I'm not going to get more than 28 kids. And 28 kids are in the, you know, like that's a, that's a lot of kids in a classroom. That's really atypical to have that many first grade students in any of the classrooms that I've been in. I would say when I'm in Ghana, if I have 50, that's about average um, first graders. I could have up to 70 first graders in that classroom. Um, so imagine having trying to get an inquiry oriented lesson where they're all talking about building number and they have manipulatives on their desk and they're all talking in their groups of four all at the same time it's maddening um and so it's one it's it's really hard for a teacher and two assistants to even get to everyone to hear what they're saying it's very difficult to, to hear yourself think. Um, I, I literally had to step out of the classroom three times because I thought my head was gonna explode. Um, it is such, and it's also really energizing, right? Because all of the kids are really engaged in making their numbers and putting their little trucks in their buckets and writing the numbers on them and talking with each other and arguing about the fact that you counted the wrong number, all 51 of them, all at the same time. And I realized I really need to conceptualize what student-centered learning looks like in Ghana a little bit differently than how I do when I work in a classroom of 22 students in the US. Um, and just understanding the capabilities of the teacher to engage students in that way, like you really have to think about, um, think about them differently. Um, also um, in Ghana, students, teachers are not, um, as connected, like the accountability structure in Ghana around teaching and students and learning is very different from here. And so typically there isn't this kind of anxiety around teaching um, that we oftentimes see with elementary, elementary teachers here. Um, they want their students to learn, but they also place a huge amount of responsibility on the students to come to class with an attitude for learning. Um, and you have a role to play. And if you show up and you're just not with it, then that's not my issue. So some of the anxiety that I think um, is built up around mathematics in particular in the US and where teachers have feel a lot of responsibility around teach students not doing well and the accountability structure. Teachers in Ghana, um, well, the ones that I worked with, they, they didn't really have that. They wanted kids to do well, but you know, if the students also show up very differently to class. Um, there is also an authority structure that they respect and adhere to. Um, and so a lot of things are also easier to navigate. So just again, in, in these fundamentally different environments, 
thinking around how to engage around these constructs um, are very different. They also have a national curriculum. Um, and so some of the problems that we would have here in the US with transient students, they don't really have. Um, and at one point I had traveled about 100 miles out of the city to observe a classroom. The classroom that I observed in the city was only two days ahead of the classroom that I observed the following day, 100 miles away. So I went to four fourth grade classrooms in the space of a week, and they were all focused on the same topic within a day, a lesson or two of each other. Um, so there are also like issues that they would have, they, they don't have to deal with in communities where they're very, um, the students are, are, are transient. So again, just again, context and being aware of the context in which they're working is really important if we're thinking about how to engage with them. Um, we, we have another question for you. Beth okay, asks, sure. um, she's interested in your thoughts and our field experience with the STEAM learning model where arts, music, design, and the humanities are interwoven with STEM subjects to add texture, connectivity, and relevance to math. Have you found that interweaving all content areas with an underpinning of how math is all around us helps young students achieve their aha moments? Um, in the limited experiences that I've had with doing that and limited in terms of the number of disciplines that have been integrated, um, and then also just in terms of the projects that I've worked on, Yes, I have seen that when we integrate math meaningfully with other constructs that it does provide a richer experience and what i'm usually looking at it from the math perspective is how is it that they're meaning for mathematical ideas what are what's the strength of what the depth with which they. They are able to make sense of mathematical ideas and in the context where i've worked it's mostly in the context of science. Um, and I've done a little bit with early childhood and language arts. I found that the students, after finishing the unit, tend to, are able to talk about and utilize the constructs in much deeper and richer ways than when we've worked with students in isolated context. So um, I give a yes, but also with the caveat that I've only had limited experience in that, in that area. But I'm a full advocate of it. The more I can get teachers to, I also think it just makes sense, right? Um, as much as you can kind of integrate um, ideas together, um, it saves time. They learn more. Um, why wouldn't we try to do that? Um, I think most of what I um, have on this slide, I've all mentioned before um, that supporting efficacy calibration is really important. Um, one of the things that I've struggled with though um, is being able to, to get teachers to have beliefs that align with how we view mathematics, meaning mathematics is not just a set of ideas that some folks hundreds of years ago created and now we're making students learn and study but that it's really a creative and constructive process that we want to engage kids in. Um, and I've struggled with getting teachers to take that up in a meaningful way. And what I mean by is they can tell me that, they can articulate that, like I asked them, what do they think of mathematics? They can say it to me in really articulate ways. And, um, but then when you know, you're know you seeing how they engage students, I'm not seeing it play out in that way. Um, and when I've looked at the other constructs, it's not those constructs that are playing out either. Um, so one of the things that I've been working on is what are ways that we can get teachers to actually really deeply conceptualize math in that way. And I've been working on just engaging teachers in problem solving. So um, one of the things that's a core when I work with teachers in like large contexts, not necessarily in coaching context, I spend a lot of time having them work on math in just fun math, just math. Um, and specifically selecting tasks where they have to build the idea and not just utilize what they know. Um, and I've recently just finished up a study where I engaged pre-service secondary teachers um, in a problem solving course. Um, and within that course, they had to read through refutation texts. 
refutation text I borrowed from science, um, where they there's a lot of work around refutation text and what it is is an actual maybe it's usually about a paragraph that one um, identifies a common misconception states why the misconception is a misconception or a naive conception and then actually gives provides the accurate um, ideas um, and so i have paired together engaging them in problem solving tasks and also refutation texts that are focused on mathematics like the notion of memorization versus idea construction um, and these small passages, and then they have to reflect on them and talk to me about how they those ideas show up in their own ways of thinking. Um, and I'm about to to kind of look at that data and see, you know, how it kind of panned out in terms of how they're thinking about mathematics. So that is to come. One of the things that has also been really interesting to me um, as well is, and I talked a little bit about the fact that efficacy tends to fluctuate over um, the process of coaching and that emotions also fluctuate. So even with the Ghana teachers where they started out really calm, like, eh, I'm just really chill around math, no anxiety, that we saw anger and anxiety really get to a noticeable point midway. Um, and then it never went all the way back down to, um, to, to, you know, kind of floor level. It kind of heightened during the middle of coaching and then kind of leveled off um, around medium anxiety. Um, and so that has also been interesting to track that um, as you are learning to engage more in student-centered teaching, um, that there is a level of anxiety that we have found to be productive and useful um, and what we've kind of made sense of that around is uh, anxiety at a particular level and on or measures that shows up at around a two tends to heighten attention to um, to the events in the classroom that are useful for learning. So when you go into a classroom a little bit, I guess, too confident and a little too laissez-faire, it doesn't focus your attention on the important aspects of that you need to be noticing as you are setting up the lesson, tracking the lesson, going through the lesson. But um, there's a level of anxiety that seems to be useful to attend to those features of the classroom. Um, and we found that particularly interesting because a lot of the literature would say that you really want to decrease anxiety as much as possible, that it's a bad thing. So, um, one thing, and this relates to, I think, I'm not sure who asked the question about um, why I do not um, model activities and, um, and teach, co-teach. Uh, a recent study that we did, um, it's we're now writing the paper from that that was done in a science education um, context where the coach actually did a lot of engagement with the teacher during the classroom. So the teacher didn't model the actual instruction, but the teacher, but the coach modeled engagement with students during the class. So the coach did a lot of the facilitation of the small group conversation um, while the teacher was also facilitating other groups and a lot of the report back um, from the teachers who had overwhelmingly positive emotions with respect to the coaching process, they uniquely identified the coach and the coach's engagement in their classrooms as something that they considered particularly um, enjoyable for them. So that's something that I'm going to have to, to kind of delve more deeply in, um, in terms of maybe um, rethinking, you know, thinking more about engagement. Um, so just in summary, um, I really do find that the outcomes of this particular project and the way that I've been trying to engage teachers by really seeing them as individuals um, and, and learners is something that they appreciate um, when we've done um, examination of just their um, their anxiety levels, their enjoyment in generally in teaching, so not necessarily looking at um, construct specific um, measures, but overall 
we've seen productive change in ways that they felt like they were thriving in their learning um, as teachers and in what they how the ways that they were able to engage students. Um, thinking about coaching cycles as also cycles of revision. So one of the things that I think it kind of mirrors is the way we think about design based research that each time we go through a cycle we're really thinking about what are we learning from that to improve the next cycle. Um, and that's one way to think about the coaching cycles that we through that process I have learned about the teacher that is going to inform the next round of working with that teacher, but in a possibly different conceptual context um, that I also have to navigate in a unique way. And I'm just going to leave it there. I just kind of thought maybe if you're interested in some of the things that I was going to be working on that you could ask and I just have the slide, but um, that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for for taking us on a tour of your work. It's been very interesting. Um, I will open it up for questions. People who have questions can speak up or raise their hand. Lovely quiet over here. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Stephen has a question. Yes, hi. You know, fabulous talk. Uh, one of my uh, doctoral students is actually going to be doing a dissertation working with elementary science teachers or elementary teachers who teach science is probably a better way to put it, um, uh, is also here. So I'm really happy that she was able to see your talk because there's a lot of connections to what she's planning on doing and, and what you talked about. So, um, so yeah, just thank you for that. Thank you for the seminar. Uh, one question that I had for you is something that you said earlier. And I just wondered, like, if you can unpack this a little bit, you said, you know, uh, referring to yourself as a, as a math teacher, you said I wasn't a really good math teacher. And I find, I don't know about you, but I find that in talking with a lot of teachers who have become math or science ed researchers, often say that. And I wonder how true that really is. Like, do, do folks really think that they weren't good teachers? Or is it just that they, that they didn't... Uh, I don't know that I'm wondering if becoming researchers is impacting the connection that they felt like they had with teaching. Like now they know things from a research perspective and now they're, I don't know, just your, what are your thoughts on that? Do, do you come across other teachers that, that say that, um, that are now researchers like at conferences and things? Because I, I find it in, in among science teachers that I talk, the science researchers that I talk to. Yeah. I. I do. Um, I think it, it's a, it's some of what you say when you when you look at classrooms and teaching from a research lens, um, especially now I was a high school teacher and when I was teaching high school, I just wanted to focus on those concepts. I didn't really know how to unpack why you're, you know, regrouping. I was like, why do you need to do that? Just like, don't you just know it? Um, so it was it was also the fact that I when I went to school to learn to be a teacher, I learned algebra calc like those were the things that we talked about in my methods classes. Um, we didn't even need to focus on fractions and so when I was teaching I would get a lot of students who were struggling with some of those ideas and were challenged in making sense of the work that I wanted them to focus on in ninth grade. And I wasn't able to support them. Um, and to some extent, I didn't think it was my responsibility because I was supposed to be teaching algebra one or algebra two. Um, and I, you needed to go get some remedial classes. So initially that was kind of um, my perspective. I think in my particular case too was, I showed up in these classrooms where the students looked like me, but our histories were very different. And I didn't quite have a really good sense of who they were. And I took that for granted. I took it for granted that because we looked the same, then we were the same. Um, and that was not the case. I had taught in Jamaica for a few years and the context was different. I taught in a school where most of the students came from affluent homes. I make the joke sometimes that if I put those kids in a box, a cardboard box with a textbook, they would have still gotten A's. Um, and then I came to a context where students were really, really struggling, and I don't think that I engaged with them in a way that really helped them. Mm. And so that's what I, that's I what see. I mean. I think I 
showed up every day. I planned for my class. I taught my lessons. I graded their papers. I gave them back. I was very sociable with them. I think I was a likable teacher, um, but I didn't, you know, looking now at the potential of how I could have supported the students, I don't think I did a very good job. So that's kind of what I mean. And I think if I can project, I think sometimes that's what other researchers. I imagine, I, I imagine the folks that I've talked to, it's there's like one specific instance that they refer to and they're like, I just did this all wrong, right? And now I know. And if I could just go back and do it all again, right? No, there were many for me, many. Yeah. I look back yeah. at many and it was just like, <laughs> that was not good. <laughs> that was not good. Thank you. <laughs> I do have some of my students now on Facebook, and I think sometimes I let myself off the hook because some of them are doing, doing well. They graduated college, and I was just like, okay, I didn't screw you off too much. Yay. <laughs> Excellent. Karen? Oh, hi. Uh, so I'm not really sure what my question is, but formulating as I talk. But earlier you had said that when you were studying the teachers in Ghana, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And you noticed that the teachers there compared to the teachers in the US, their stress level wasn't as much because if the student didn't learn the math, you said that, uh, well, they their perception was, well, it's on a student, right, um, to learn it, whereas, in the US, if the student didn't learn it, the teacher felt like it was really their fault. Is that, I just wanted to first confirm, is that, did I get that right? No, yes, mainly, not necessarily in its entirety. It wasn't that it was all the, the teacher's fault. Like the teachers in Ghana wasn't thinking, okay, it's all your fault. It's just that they didn't internalize it to the depth of uh -huh. this is solely my responsibility. They recognized that students had a role to play in this. Yeah. I came and I taught my lesson. It was a good lesson. Why? You need to do your part and study. Yeah. And why do you, why, why is it, why is there such a difference? Do you think like, why is it in America over the years? It's, it's teachers here now internalize like, okay, the student didn't learn. It's on me. You know, that, that does add a lot of stress. Um, mm -hmm. you know, to, I, I'm a teacher. I teach at, um, a post, uh, high school level. And, and a lot of the teachers here are stressed because we internalize that. Like uh, if our students don't learn the math or the physics or the chemistry, we get the message. It's you, you know, like what can you do to make sure the students are learning better? And when we have said, well, maybe our students aren't studying hard enough. <laughs> you know, the message we get from our leadership, I work for the Navy, is it's you. And, and then, you know, you made this comment about how it's different in Ghana. And I'm like, where did America, how did we get here? Because that, that to me is where a huge part of the stress of teaching here is, comes from. Yeah. When I was, um, I'll just give you a story that I, I still find funny. Um, when I was teaching, I taught for three years in Jamaica and I remember, um, and I, I, I taught at the school that I graduated from as a student. Um, and I remember one of my colleagues there um, she taught um, principles of business and we had this staff house and sometimes we would go sit in and talk about, you know, we shared students. So we talk about students and there was this one student, let's call him James. Um, and James just would show up in class and literally do nothing. I taught math. James would just not come to class and do nothing. At the time, I felt no responsibility at all for James passing math in exams. I taught class. You didn't do your work, you didn't turn anything in. Most of the time I didn't get any homework. I told your parents, um, you got detention, all of this stuff. Zero responsibility if James was gonna get a zero on, or get an F. Um, my colleague also had him in her principles of business class. And um, 
James would show up similar, just want to crack jokes, not really want to focus on doing anything. She also was like, we used to have to make predictions for what they would get on, we had like a major exam at the end of 11th grade. And I put that he would have gotten a four. One was the highest grade. Um, and she um, also equally, she predicted he would have gotten a five. James got a one in math and a one in principles of business. And he came to the, to the staff house when he got his results. And, you know, he asked for us and he, you know, wanted to show not just to brag, but he was actually thanking us because he ascribed responsibility to some extent to what, how we taught to him getting these grades. And I remember my friend saying, please do not thank me. I take no responsibility for you getting this, this, this A because you did nothing in my class. So, <laughs> you know, so it, it, and I, I, to this day, I laugh because it wasn't like, she was like, I did what I was supposed to do. You didn't do what you were supposed to do in my class. I'm glad that you did whatever you were doing outside of my class, but I don't see how anything that I did kind of, and, I, and I'm fine with that because I did my job. Um, and it's, 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 I find like it's, it is very different here. And I, I, the, the difference in culture was palpable when I moved here X number of years ago. And I think a part of it is the way, it's the, the way that the systems are set up too, um, where teachers are in some districts are compensated and schools are ranked. Schools are, are ranked in a lot of school districts based on those test scores. And so, and having those test scores are really important in terms of like it communicates that this is a good school, right? Um, and good schools means that people employed in those schools are doing good things, right? It doesn't indicate necessarily that this school 90% of the students are coming from affluent homes where they have resources that the schools that are considered these schools, most of the students in those schools are coming from households that are not affluent and, and parents are often struggling in ways that the parents aren't. Where, where we have kind of put the causal uh, connection is that the people who are organizing the systems in those schools are doing a great job. Um, and that's why the outcome is what it is. So it's not a looking at the larger sociocultural context around that school. It's really kind of like this cause and effect. If you have a school system and it's running efficiently and effectively with the principal and the students, then you're gonna have good output. So high learning. And if you see that the learning isn't great, then it's clearly the structure, the organization of that system that is not working. Um, and I think at some point along the way, that's how it was kind of set up and no one really, well, you know, attends to the larger um, system that's at play in terms of how students show up in classrooms. I've also noticed, because um, a lot of the, people at my school, we've been hiring them from local high schools from Rhode Island and Massachusetts, and they've actually chosen to come to our school, taking a pay cut, mind you, because they feel that in the public schools, there's this trend where teachers now have to act like parents. You know, not only are you teaching the math or the science, now we have to be like their mentors, almost like their guidance counselors. And uh, does that happen in Ghana too? Like are teachers there expected to play a parent role as well? No, no not to the extent that they have to do it in the US. Um, and that was kind of my comment earlier mm -hmm. that more and more student teachers are having to take on uh, a lot more than just the academic and intellectual development of the child. Um, I mean, the pandemic and students, um, their mental health decreasing, and now it's now a significant aspect of the role that teachers need to play in that they have to attend to the social emotional needs of the, of the child. Um, I'm not commenting on whether that's a good or bad thing, but that is not a cross, that's not a global thing. Mm. Um, um, in Ghana, students show up to school, they go to class, they are in class. Teachers have a relationship with the student, but they don't find that they are the ones that they 
that they're responsible for attending to these needs in an overt way. That is definitely not the, um, that's not the culture. Um, they don't, I mean, they don't abuse their kids overtly. I mean, that I say that in terms of that's the way I look at it. I think other people will go in classrooms because a lot of these schools still have corporal punishment for kids. Um, I think that's a cultural thing that we can have a different conversation around, but I don't find that the teachers abuse their children. Um, I find for the most part children, they play a lot. Um, that might also be, I find that the time kids in the US have to play is quite minimal. Mm. Um, in Ghana, they, they have a lot of playtime. Um, so they are, you know, they make a lot of noise, they interact with each other, they have a, um, they have a good time. I think even in, um, in classrooms, there's generally just a freeness um, around how children interact too. It's kind of light and, you know, like really playful. Um, so. Thank you. We have other questions. In the in the comments, Nazia posted a comment, which was that the, she she finds your um, context interesting. She's also coming from a country which has huge teacher student ratio and a national curriculum. So coaching is a great initiative for helping teachers out. Yeah, great, great. But as you said, the, the context matters with um, with large classrooms. You just have to think differently about how you you want to support um, teachers. And then also when there is, uh, for example, in Ghana, they were strictly traditional um, ways of learning, very teacher centered. Um, they had a national reform initiative in 2019, which is how I kind of ended up going. I wanted to kind of see what was going on. And a significant aspect of that um, part of that initiative, it wasn't just a curriculum reorganization, but it was really centered on shifting instruction holistically towards a student centered model. So if you think 2019, and I, I was there in, in from 2021 to 2022, um, for a lot of the teachers, this is new stuff they're hearing. Um, students have voice, they're the ones that are supposed to be talking, they're the ones that are supposed to be um, ideas that are supposed to be shared, you're to serve as facilitator. Most of them did not know what that looked like. So they were not taught in that way. When they were in teachers college, that was not the you know, that was not the ideology that was communicated. And so this is, this is new to, to all of them. So when I say they don't know what it looked like, it means I kind of had to show them on video. Like, what does it mean? So they went to some professional development, but it was all, it was a lot of, it was a lot of traditional talking to professional development. Um, so, so yeah, again, context, you I would say I would go into any classroom in the US and say student centered teaching and they would be like yeah been hearing about that for years. Mm -hmm. What was the um, Ghanaian teachers response and reaction to having 50 students trying to do student centered learning at once. Um, the. They their response was better than mine. So when I said, I'm not exaggerating, where I said I had to step out of the classroom three times because I felt like the, the volume of just chatter was going to have my head explode. Um, and the teachers were just in it. They were really, for a lot of them, not having seen that before was exciting. Um, and when I say see that before was, one, the attention that their students the sustained attention their students had on the activity for the duration of the time, the ways that their students were making sense of what was going on, even though half the time you were really fighting to hear what a student was saying at any particular time. Um, at one point, probably around after 35 minutes, um, we quieted them down and then they, you know, groups took turn coming up to talk about what they were doing. 
And I think they were really startled by the ways that students were able to talk about how they were thinking. I told them that it would happen, but you know, it's like, yeah, whatever. This American woman is here, whatever. Okay, fine, we'll just do it. Um, but I, I don't think that it was real until they saw it. Um, and that was, that was great. So, um, but I think during the process, the, the teacher stayed in the classroom. It was just like, oh, they're noisy. It wasn't something that they've been used to because these students come to class and they, if the teacher says be quiet, the whole class is quiet. Like they don't have um, classroom management issues there at mm -hmm. all. Um, so, so the, if the, the teacher says, you know, like talk, I, I can imagine it was overwhelming for them too, but they navigated it much better than I did. Just so that's another thing, Karen, that's different. They don't have classroom management issues. Right. Does the, um, the reform in Ghana also include providing materials to the teachers so if they want to keep teaching that way, they actually have the support of curriculum materials to do it? They promised curriculum materials when I was there, which was two years after the official. Well, okay, let's let's ignore the COVID year. So let's say one year mm -hmm. after they had not received. They had received minimal um, tools. So I brought tools and left them there. So I brought a whole gamut of uh, manipulatives and left them with the teachers. But that was ninety about ninety five percent of what they had gotten. They gotten textbooks, but no manipulatives yeah. so the if they for schools that i wasn't working with which were a lot i worked with two schools um they had to be creative so things like bottle caps um popsicle sticks kind of like old school us right right um yeah and so you'd go into a classroom and see like a big jar with bottle caps in it or like popsicle sticks with elastic bands um so they were they were pretty creative in some spaces um, and especially kindergarten, first grade, second grade, um, early childhood teachers generally are more oriented the way that they are prepared to work with students to be more open that you have to have things for them to touch and feel. Um, as opposed to third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade teachers where for them it's like the abstract, it was harder to get them to to be more creative it's like it was a struggle for them to think okay what would I do here. Um, Stephen? Yeah, I'll ask another question. So I, I was really kind of uh, fascinated with this, with your construct of blended emotions. And uh, I haven't really come across that term before. So I was really excited to hear you talk about that. And I wondered, is it you, you seem to focus on anxiety and excitement. I wondered if, is it, is it just that, that dichotomy of emotions or, because when you were talking about the teacher as a, as a human and as a person in and outside of the classroom, I mean, we're bringing so many different emotions into the classroom. So I wondered if your, if your work focuses on, you know, other emotions that teachers might um, have. And I, and, and following up on that also is, so much of emotions that happens in the classroom, um, both in and out of the classroom, um, can change so quickly, right? Like what you what you expect to see on one day wouldn't necessarily be the, the same thing that you would see on another day. So I wondered, like, you know, do you does your work at all look at sort of fluctuations uh, of of emotions? So I'm sorry I, if I communicated that. So no, I was just using enjoyment and anxiety as an example. Mm. Um, but in in my work and in the particular article that we we wrote about this, it it just shows how a range of different emotions that teachers describe show up as they're talking about how they're teaching. So I just picked enjoyment and, and anxiety. Sometimes oh. it's two positive emotions, like they might say, um, I'm relieved and excited. So they could do two positive emotions. Sometimes you get two negative emotions. I'm really frustrated and I'm also a little bit anxious. Or you might get um, to opposite valence emotions. So one positive, one negative. Um, in the particular study that we, we did kind of tracking um, mixed emotions and mixed emotions are the emotions where there's one positive, where there is, there's a blend of positive and negative. It could be multiple positive or multiple negative. That was the most um, common mm. emotional experience by the teachers. So that 
for us was particularly significant because it's not talked about in the literature a lot. It's really, you would get the, the idea that, oh, they experience enjoyment and enjoyment they have for the whole lesson. It doesn't really give you this sense that there are, there are multiple emotions that can be elicited around a particular um, part of teaching. Um, and then we didn't track it necessarily. Um, we tracked it for, for across the coaching for the year mm -hmm. um, relative to, um, to each coaching cycle, but not necessarily during a particular lesson. And it was always, you know, retrospective because we didn't, some of the work that's being done now in emotions, they actually put probes on teachers so they can kind of monitor the physiology um, and then have them kind of reporting during the experience. Um, for us, it was always retroactive, you know, kind of retrospective, like what were you experiencing during that lesson? So teacher perceptions or teacher reported um, data on yeah. their emotion, their emotional states or their emotions at the, at various states of the lesson is what you're saying. And we also had it in anticipation of, so I would always ask them, okay, so now that we've kind of talked about and planned this lesson, what are your emotions? What are you thinking about? Um, what is your emotion related to student thinking? What is your emotion related to teaching? Um, and then I would track it again at the end. Great, thanks. Sure. Anybody else? Then I think we will let um, Dion go and enjoy her Friday evening. And thank you so much for sharing with us. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you for having me. This has yeah. been wonderful. Great. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much.